because there's nothing worse than having that feeling in your stomach when you walk in through the door every morning. Ah, here I am again, about to fail. <laughs>
this one was also associated with uh, being 50 years old and maybe searching for something else, um, you know, to maybe wind up or even wind down my career. I'm pretty sorry I've um, been a wind up of my career uh, up and not wind up, but definitely up. It has, it has accelerated my personal growth and hopefully I've accelerated some, some clients growth as well. And and you talked about your your introduction. I mean that that actually was one of the questions I was going to ask. You know, most of us coaches, some something something happens in our world where we where we think about, okay, what's next? You know, I want to do something different from here. And you know, for me, it was very much very much like you. I did I knew that I didn't want to work for anyone else. I was never going to have another job again. For me, I didn't have the energy to do another startup. I'd done a, a few startups in a in a row. Uh, and I had no idea what I was going to be doing next. And, and fortuitously, I bumped into a former colleague who had gone down the business coaching path and, and, uh, he suggested that I explore doing the same thing. And, and as you just alluded to, we ended up in Atlanta in uh, early 2016 together, uh, doing our scaling up training. With, with more than one common bond on the scaling up, we, we, we enjoyed the odd, uh, beer at the. <laughs> the place across the street to grow our friendship. You probably remember the name. <laughs> I think it was called Gimli's and it was a, a themed Irish pub that we probably spent far too much time in over over the course of the, the training and, and the conference indeed. And we ended up yeah. back there a couple of years later, probably about three or four years later for uh, another another conference, another scaling up summit a few years later. Yes, yeah, so, so we went back. We went back. Of course we did. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, so you got certified in scaling up and this is going back to, you know, 2016, 2017. How did you go about building up your coaching business? So at first, uh, you get certified scaling up and, and I know you've heard me say this before, but I'll say it for who's ever watching as well. I, I'm a certified coach and I still really have no idea how I am supposed to um, benefit clients. You know, what, what does coach do? And um, Shannon uh, Susco, my, who is my sister, um, said, look, you've been certified, you did a great job. And, and I'm still going, yeah, but what do we do? And she offered for me to come and, um, you know, audit a couple of her sessions with clients, um, which was um, just such a big step forward. Um, because she was actually practicing metronomics before there was a metronomics. And, you know, she, she doesn't tell me that this is not, you know, the, the gazelle's way, if you will. And um, so I'm going, oh, this is easy. You follow the steps. You just go through the steps. I, I can coach somebody through steps. And, and, you know, in my career, I have been coaching everything possible for the longest time. I'm sure that was my leadership style as well. Um, but I coached skiing, baseball, basketball, football, anything that I had some knowledge in, I was coaching. So it was really natural for me to step into something to coach it. Shannon gave me the understanding of exactly what it was we were coaching because it's a game. Once you get the rules of the game down, Pat, and you have a framework to make sure that you're winning, it was easy to coach that game. And it was easy to watch a client and their senior leadership team perform the moves and, and and look at them and go, hey, we could do this better, we could do that better. No different than coaching any other sport. Um, and I think that's why, in general, I have gravitated more and more and more to doing this, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. We are dealing with human beings after all, and that is probably the most, um, I mean, we're all unique. It is the most unique position we can be in. Everybody's different. What next tool will help them get going faster? I love asking that question. And I, and I think we're very privileged as coaches because we, we have the opportunity to sort of look into an organization in a way that no one in the organization can see. Uh, and that, that gives us a bit of a unique opportunity to, to, to give them the advice and the guidance and the coaching uh, that's really going to make a difference because they can't see it. They're they're too close to the problems in their business. They're too close to the things that are blocking them and getting in their way. Whereas we have this independent, impartial view. Now we are we're not there to to do it for them. We're there to show them how to do it. 
Uh, and you, you alluded to earlier on to sort of you know, doing metronomics before metronomics existed. And I remember some very early conversations where I was talking about some of the scaling up tools and, and you were looking at me blankly and you were talking about some of the tools that you were using. And I was looking at you blankly and it, it took us a little while to connect, didn't it? It was, it was, an, inter- it was an interesting phase. We, we thought we were doing the same thing. We were, we were so not doing the same thing. Yeah. I, I love that you said that. So I often say, look, I'm that set of eyes. Um, and I can't think of the coach's name that said this to me. Uh, I know they're still coaching. And, and the first thing when, when I got going, because this goes back to your question about how I, you know, how, how did I get my practice going? A lot of that was, you know, Shannon helping and saying, this is what we do. But then you have to, you know, attract people for you to do it for. And, um, the book Getting Naked by Pat Lencioni was put in my hands and said, look, read this. This is a very uh, consultative sales approach. Provide value before anybody has ever even offered you any money. Just provide value. And then, you know, further, you start reading Lencioni and it's really great. And, and he talks about some other things. Um, in particular, he always talks in his consulting practice about we get paid to enter the danger. So we can see the danger. Of course we can. And we can sit back and play nice guy and get paid the next month, the next month, the next month. But we are doing the client a disservice if we see something and don't say it because it might be dangerous to our coaching relationship. And and I I know you've heard me talk on this before. I promise I will enter the danger every time. And if it results in me losing my position as coach, that's okay. Okay. They pay us so that we will say what we see. And I love that idea. You get nervous when you're about to say it. And you go, I'm just about to tell the guy he should fire his son. And, you know, you still have to say it. Um, Or, you know, promote somebody that that is uniquely qualified and they don't see it. So both, both areas can be dangerous and we should say it. Whether we're right or wrong, we should say it. Absolutely. And uh, there was always going to be at least one Patrick Lencioni reference in, in this, uh, this conversation today. Uh, but your, your, your comments about entering the danger, um, I, had a, I had a conversation with one of my clients uh, just earlier this week, uh, and I had to enter the danger with him. And it made me really uncomfortable uh, because, as you say, it potentially threatens that coach-client relationship. Uh, But his hiring sucked. He'd gone through a series of really, really poor leadership team hires. And it was, it was holding his business back. It was stopping him from achieving what he wanted to achieve. And he was a very, very driven man. And this was just holding him back. He, He couldn't see that he was hiring the wrong people. He was hiring people like him. He was hiring people for ability, totally ignoring the fact that most people he was hiring were not good cultural fits. I, 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 even though it's hard, um, I now preface the line where I'm about to say something that is really scary for me to say with, you pay me to be another set of eyes. I will enter the danger because I trust you. Here's what I am seeing. Yep. And yep. you know what? These are all human beings and it is hard for them to hear sometimes and still they will show you gratitude for saying it. Yep, yep. I, I do something similar. I always ask for permission to be brutally frank. I ask for permission to be brutally frank, and they always, always, always say yes, because they get that that is your role. They might not like it, they might not want to hear it, but they understand that, that is your role. And at the end of the day, it's their role as well, because we are going to cascade the coaching system, and they must enter into coaching relationships as well with all of their people. And at the, I guess, expense possibly of their coaching relationship with their senior leadership team, they also must enter the danger. Which is challenging, which is very challenging. I I would guarantee you that any of us that have been in a senior leadership role, the hardest thing to do is to uh, let somebody go who is genuinely giving it their all and we leave them stay too long. We always leave them stay too long. We never ever have been accused of firing too fast. And it's always because we're human and we think we can coach them up and across the line. And typically we cannot, if we have been giving it the appropriate amount of effort 
we are seeing through human eyes and they will not make it. And by the way, the person that you're letting go, they don't want to come into work and fail every day either. We got to find them a seat, maybe not even in our company, where they can succeed and be happy every day when they come to work. Because yeah, there's nothing worse than having that feeling in your stomach when you walk in through the door every morning. Ah, here I am again, about to fail. <laughs> Hey, look, I'm sure we'll come back to other Patrick Lencioni books uh, later on. Uh, but I, I wanted to, I just wanted to talk about peer coaching for a moment. Uh, so you and I met in 2016 and, and very soon after that, we decided that we were going to become each other's peer coaches. Uh, so just for the people watching, uh, we meet every week or as close to that as our schedules allow. It's not always possible. Uh, and we, we really... We, we meet weekly really for one key thing, and that's really to hold each other to account. Uh, so we share information, we share um, interesting books, we share new tools, but the real meat of this peer coaching relationship is all about holding each other to account. Um, I've got a huge amount of value from you know meeting with you, Damien, sort of every week for, what's it now, the last six, seven, eight years. Uh, and that that's something that I think is is missing for a lot of people. You know, that peer coaching relationship. What what do you, what do you see as as being important in a peer coaching relationship? Well, first and foremost, I think you should enter into a peer coaching relationship with a person who is way smarter than you. And I did that, so I am thankful. <laughs> well, I think we'd both say that we're smart in different ways. Yeah. Well, I think, and that's key. So I think if you asked either of us independently at any time, who's getting more out of this relationship, we would both say, I do. And I think that is key to, to finding the right person to sit down with every week. Um, I love our discussion topics because anything, you know, that, that anybody in the world is doing where they have a peer, whether they're in the same business or not in the same business, that they can um, go and unload a little bit and say, you know, what do you think? And where should I go and what should I do? And forum groups are great for that too. One-on-one um, -on -one is a lot more personal because we've dumped personal stuff on the table as well and, and said, look, this is the way that makes me feel when I'm working at this or working at that. And it's nice to hear even today where we both go, yeah, I feel that way too. And, and so much of what we do is all about mindset. It's all about you know what's in the head, you know, both individually as a coach, uh, but also the people that we're coaching. And... What, what I really value from our peer coaching relationship is that ability to, you know, to have someone that you can bounce things off and share with things with, you know, and as you say, even if they, they can be quite personal as, as well as professional. Yeah. I would encourage everybody. Um, and this was all your idea, by the way, you approached me and I had to ask you what a peer coach was. Um, I would now suggest this to anybody that they find somebody in their circle, whether at work or not at work, and say, hey, how about we have a session once a week, once every two weeks, but rhythmical, where we have a set agenda and we can speak to each other about the agreed upon things that we will be talking about. And whatever it is, whatever we have put on the table, uh, we have been successful in helping the other person um, move forward. And not, not resolve necessarily, but definitely move forward. Sure, sure, sure. And it's, it's not always easy fitting into schedules. I mean, you're in Halifax in Nova Scotia in Canada. I'm in Sydney, Australia. Now, our time zones are not particularly compatible, but we find a way to make it work. And if that means moving or cancelling every now and then, well, we'll catch up next time or we'll, we'll reschedule. Yeah, I like our greeting. Good morning, good evening. <laughs> good morning, good evening, indeed. <laughs> so if you haven't got a peer coach, get a peer coach. I, I, I would agree with that sentiment 100%. So Damon, you've been coaching for a long time, same time as me, coming up for nearly 10 years now. So what would you say that, what would you say is the biggest impact that you coaching has had on you personally, not for your clients, but you personally, what's the biggest impact on your life being a coach? That is um, the most easy thing to put my finger on. Um, as CEO, I probably made, um, a massive mistake and, and I got so busy, I put learning um, sort of as a secondary thing uh, to do in the run of a day, be it books, podcasts, or many podcasts like that. Um, you know, 
uh, conventions, speakers, whatever it could be. And in this role, you must lead people into learning um, and be the example. And not, and not only like books, podcasts, you know, the thought leaders and making sure that you have a good understanding of their things and, and certainly how that stuff plugs into metronomics. Um, people generally ask me, where do you learn the most? I learn the most one-on-one -on -one in my coaching relationships. I make a point of not being a um, industry expert in the industries that I'm coaching. I have very little knowledge of what my clients actually do. Um, because I don't want to be a consultant. So not only am I learning what they do, I am helping them in how they do it. Um, and the how is the metronomics. And that learning curve has been steep, immense, and it is not slowing down. And I, I, is, it is the funnest thing we do. Yeah, I, I think I'd, uh, I'd agree. For, for, for me, what I feel very grateful for is that I'm now doing something where I can spend a significant amount of my time actually reading and learning. And, and you know, we're, we're very different people and I get a lot of my energy, for, you know, my unique ability. And I might ask you about yours in, in a moment. So get prepared for that. My unique ability is the ability to learn something incredibly quickly and then be able to replay it back in a really, really simple form. Uh, so that, you know, that's really what I see as my unique ability. So learning is, you know, one of my number one core values. And I, I probably get through about, you know, one book a week, sometimes more, sometimes a little bit less. Um, but if you're not learning and if the clients that we're working with are not working and the leadership teams that we're, we're, we're working with are not learning, then they're probably not right for me. So what is your unique ability, Damien? <laughs> that's a tough question. Um, I've been asked that recently by by a, uh, a client that was looking for a coach that we hadn't engaged yet. We, we have now engaged in a coaching relationship. I think besides the idea that I am good at picking CEOs who are going to do it, and yes, I've made mistakes. Um, I also think that I am generally uh, good at coaching. Um, and, and I... I don't think it matters what, as long as I have some knowledge of, you know, where the player is wanting to go and how, um, how vested they are going to be in the process of getting there. Um, I seem to be able to help them along and continue helping them have a good experience doing it. Sounds simple, but uh, it just, it seems to happen. So, so, you, so you mentioned just then that you don't focus on any industry sectors. What, what, why is that? I was tired of solving the same problems that I was solving as a CEO. Um, that makes you a consultant, and that's not something I wanted to be. Um, and, and I really brought that uh, home with some solid data. One day, I did decide to coach somebody who was in a hospitality-oriented business, and I became exactly that. I became a consultant. Uh, our coaching relationship went out the window. I was being relied on expertise in the industry rather than expertise in developing the model and building um, the framework. Um, I do not do that anymore. Now I specifically look for people that I cannot help. They're experts at their jobs. They already can do it. What they're looking for is a better way to behave together, and the framework really helps us do that. Yeah, I, if I if I get asked by a potential client, you know how much I know about their industry, um, my response to them is, "Ah, it sounds like you need a consultant, not a coach." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they can hire and, a consultant uh, and a coach. And indeed, indeed, indeed. But the the least I or the less I know more about the client's business the more impartial I can be, the more I can coach rather than consult. Okay, so moving on. Now, a lot of the conversations I have with uh, metronomics coaches, they've all got their favorite tool or their favorite technique. You know, the one that sort of, you know, when they're, when they're teaching or coaching through that with a client, you know, that's, that's really the tool that they come back to and they, they enjoy coaching most. Uh, what would you say is your favorite tool out of the toolkit? 
Um, funny, when I first started coaching, I, I loved uh, digging into five dysfunctions. I loved it, loved it, loved it. And I, I still do it. And I, and I went to a bunch of sessions to learn to do it better. And I still use it whenever necessary. My favorite right now, because it is hard and it requires people to understand their business, their competitor's business, I, I like the attribution framework the best by far. When you get it right, um, there is so much confidence built into everybody's attitudes to move the company forward. Yeah, and if you're not familiar with the attribution framework, it's basically a, a tool that allows you to map out your market and the attributes of the market, so the things the market cares about, and then assess how good you and your competitors are at meeting those needs of the market. Uh, and this is part of the uh, the competitor analysis process before we move on to identifying differentiators. Uh, so one of, one of my favorite tools as well. Some people get it straight away. For others, they really struggle with it. They they don't know enough about their competitors to really finish off the tool. So for, I often find that it takes two goes. They can map out themselves, but then they've got to go away and think about their competitors. Have you have you seen that also? Yeah, hundred percent. And and I love when somebody goes, well, we don't we don't know how to rate our competitors on those attributes. And, and yet they've rated themselves beautifully. Um, then they go out and they do the, the appropriate research. They come back with the competitors mapped. And surprisingly, their line has changed significantly as well because relevant to those competitors, they weren't perfect. <laughs> so you know, there, there was a new bar being set in each attribute, and then they were marking themselves relevant to whoever was the best in that particular attribute. And, and I would say, Jed, uh, my experience would be even three times to get a level of confidence where they go, that that's it. And then I love assigning somebody the ownership of that to say, okay, let's not let you forget about this because the market is evolving every day. So we need to pay attention to this. I'll, I'll, I'll share my, my favorite tool. So for, for me, the tool that I get the most impact from and therefore probably the tool that I like the most is the key function flow in an initial kickoff meeting now by 11 o'clock you know you're getting reactions like now i've learned more about my business in the last 30 minutes than i have done in the last year and uh, now i finally understand how we make money i finally understand what are the things we need to be driving uh, so for me that's about you know impact immediate impact in the first session in the first day of a kickoff yeah, I couldn't agree more. And and funny, you said, what's your favorite tool? And I, I, if you, you had a phrase that a little differently, I'm like, well, you can't do anything without the KFFM. It is the foundation of everything. It's the foundation of everything. Yeah. We might have used that phrase before, once or twice. Maybe once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> so, Damon, you talked about uh, being a keen learner and a keen reader. Now, what are the, if you had to pick a handful of books that you would say everyone should go out and read, what would be your pick? Of late, I am recommending BE 2.0 by Jim Collins to everybody because it really touches on almost all the essential business tools. And and then, and then of course, he references back. And if you want to learn a little bit more about this tool, go read this book, this book, and this book. So it's almost like an appendix of how to do business. And then uh, secondly, and I think you know that I'm working on this, I love Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. I just think it's a tool that everybody can use in every moment of their life because uh, life is honestly a negotiation um, in every sort of uh, chance meeting, personal relationship, long-term relationship. They are all just negotiating for what you want to do. And sometimes what you want to do is what somebody else wants to do. So, you know, it, it's lots of a negotiation, but uh, I, I love his take on things. I love his tools. And I think we should all use them as much as possible. And out of the books you've read recently, is there any one book that you'd add to, to that list? Something that's made a significant impact over the last few months? Uh, um, yeah, I think so. And I read it by chance. Um, I was reading... Um, 10x is years easier than 2x. Uh, I think it's Benjamin Hardy, if I'm not mistaken. And he kept reference, referencing back to a book that he had wrote with Dan Sullivan earlier called uh, Who Not How. And I, 
I love who, not how. And, and I, I, I think I, when he was starting to say what the principles are that he's describing, I'm like, well, doesn't everybody do that? And so apparently it's not as much common sense as I thought. And uh, so I am um, distributing that wisdom to clients as fast as I can. If you, know, if you want to go 10x is easier than 2x, then you better find a lot of who's to get your how's done. Um, and especially the right who's. And, you know, Jim Collins would talk about that again and again and again. First who, not how. Um, but in this particular book, I like that he makes delegation a superpower, not a weakness. So if you're putting something off and off and off and off, it, generally because you don't want to do it or you're not good at it, um, find a who to do it. And, and, and go do the things that you're excellent at and that you enjoy doing because you're going to be better for everybody. And by the way, be somebody else's who too for the things that you're good at. So I like that very, very much. Yeah, I suspected that might be one of your one of your picks. It was is either going to be 10x or it's going to be who, not how. Uh, so, yeah, so, um, I chose, yeah. Yeah. so I chose. Yeah, both. indeed. <laughs> yeah, how about well, you? Well, I, I, I would probably say uh, 10x is easier than 2x, um, but I also got a lot of value out of you know who, not how for sure. And, and coincidentally, Ben Hardy is also speaking at our Tip Top Summit in Whistler in April. In April, so really looking forward to his keynote there. Uh, he's um, he's an incredibly young and incredibly smart guy who is who is making a massive impact. And uh, you know, you can only be a, a tiny, tiny bit envious at the impact he's making at such a young, early age. Yeah, and I, I love that uh, you did say it's a coincidence that we read it. Um, I was reading the book when already when it was announced that he was speaking. So I'm like, oh, that's one less book I have to be uh, reading to get ready for this. So um, very much a coincidence yeah, for so me. So you've already done your homework or some of your homework. Some of it, some of it. There's more yeah. to read. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's let's move on. So another question. Any recommendations for new coaches and CEOs who are starting out on their metronomics journey? So pointing that question firstly at CEOs. So what would you suggest they should do? Uh, and then we'll move on to new coaches. Okay. At last year's Tip Top, I had a client of mine speak. And um, he, he talked about what the number one thing is that he had done to roll into metronomics and roll metronomics out to his team. And um, I loved his answer. It was really simple. Just make the decision and go all in on it and get a coach. And I thought that was, uh, you know, Pat Lencioni could write a book on advice that that's, that is that simple because it's common sense for us, maybe not common sense for everybody. Make the decision, go all in and get a coach. That's what I would tell any CEO. So you need the willingness and the desire, but beyond that, you also need the commitment to the process. Yep. And, and by the way, you know what? You can self-implement this. It is 100% more expensive every single time than getting a coach. Um, there's, there's still an investment of your time. There's an investment of your speed, your growth speed, as, as you know, maybe competitors catch you, pass you. Um, if the right client connects with the right coach and it is it is a unique coaching relationship you know i can't coach everybody i coach people that we connect with you coach people you connect with so it has to be right for both sides and if you do get that right uh, you will certainly um, get so much roi from the investment or you know return on the investment both with your time, your coach's time, and your very valuable fund. And the same question to a new metronomics coach. So a coach that is just starting out on their journey, maybe even before they've completed their certification, what would you suggest they should, the one thing that would make the most impact for them? I might even say two things on this. One, I would um, get a mentor, somebody who's coached. Um, I think that gets you in the community very quickly. Um, you know, it's almost like having a buddy to introduce you around, not only to the right coaches um, so that you can engage and learn from the co coaching community, but also the right people around you in your business community. And then secondly, I would say maybe further to the same sort of line of thinking, um, get a peer coach, do what we did. It, it's been an amazing tool. And 
you know, when we're going well, we can celebrate together when we're going not so well. And, you know, we need help um, getting a new client or help with a client. We have somebody to talk to every single week. Yeah, you can support each other, which makes a huge difference. Okay, that's that's a, that's a awesome, Damon. Thanks so much. So, I- interesting enough, we're going to be bumping into each other very, very closely. So you you've, you've got a family trip planned out to New Zealand in early April, and you're coming back through Sydney. So we actually get to meet. So just for people watching, David and I get to meet on the Thursday, and then we in Sydney, and then we get to meet again just three days later in Vancouver in Canada for the Tip Top Summit. So I'm really looking forward to that. We had the summit in Whistler last year in May, uh, 2023. Uh, that was an amazing few days, some great speakers, including Alex Osterwalder and a bunch of other really good speakers. Uh, amazing range of speakers for this year's summit as well. So I'm really looking forward to that. So any parting words from you, Damien? Well, I am looking forward to a peer coaching call in person in Sydney, Australia. Maybe over a dark lager. Who knows? Or maybe even a Negroni. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, thanks so much for taking the time today, Damon. We always enjoy chatting with you and lovely to get the insights and uh, great insights as well. Uh, book recommendations. Um, I'll note those down in the, uh, in the podcast notes. Uh, and uh, looking forward to catching up with you at our next peer meeting, which is just a week away. And again in April in both Sydney and Vancouver. Well, thanks for having me along. And hopefully uh, anybody who uh, decided to uh, drop in on us speaking got some value out of it. Okay. Thanks, Damien. And we'll catch up later. Tip Top is brought to you by Metronomics. To find out more about Metronomics and how this 20 plus year old proven system will save you time and money as you grow up your business, visit metronomics.com. That is M-E-T-R-O-N-O-M-I-C-S dot com. Also search for Metronomics in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere else that great podcasts are found.